Hi there. In the last video, we looked at work, um, the basic concept of work, and we finished with its relationship to energy. And that's where we're going to start this video. We're going to look at different types of energy, just a quick recap of the different types. And then we're going to move on to um, two specific types of energy. We're going to look at gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy, and how energy is conserved within a gravitational system. Okay, so. Um, we saw last time that the work done on, ob on an object is equal to the energy transferred to that object. So they're both measured in joules and they're both equal to each other. If you do a certain amount of work, that will transfer the same amount of energy to that object or that system. So here we've got a man pushing the car. He's doing the work and the energy is being transferred to the car. All right, They're both measured in joules. And they're like two sides of the same coin, if you like. Work done and energy transferred. Okay, so how many types of energy are there? Well, there are lots, and here's a list that you should be familiar with. We've got kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy, elastic potential energy, thermal energy, chemical potential, light, and uh, extending that into radiant energy, sound energy, and electrical potential energy. Now, in mechanics, we, um, we focus mainly on kinetic and gravitational potential energy, but we also do some stuff with elast elastic potential energy. So kinetic is due to an object's motion, gravitational potential is due to the position in a gravitational field, elastic potential is due to the separation or the changing separation of the uh, atomic or molecular bonds within a material. Um, these are all from different topics, so we're not really going to discuss too many of those uh, right now. The word potential is worth focusing on for a little bit. The word potential, you may remember, means stored. So energy that is stored in an object is called potential energy. So, for example, gravitational potential energy is a stored energy. And it's stored in the object while it is at a given height um, above a reference level, uh, which is usually the floor um, in a gravitational field. Okay, so if you do work on objects, you do work against some of these things here. Um, and that changes different types of energy. So if you do work against gravity, then obviously you are going to change an object's gravitational potential energy. Uh, if you do work against a body's inertia, and if you remember the, the definition of mass, uh, which is related to inertia, inertia is kind of the reluctance of an object to change its velocity. So if you're doing work against that, you're actually going to change the object's velocity and you're going to uh, change the kinetic energy of the object. And if you do work against friction, you're actually going to increase the thermal energy of that object, all right? It's going to heat up effectively when you do work against friction. Okay, so we're going to focus on these two types of energy, as I say. Uh, these equations should be familiar to you. Gravitational potential energy equals the object's mass multiplied by the strength of the gravitational field multiplied by the height of the object in that gravitational field. Now, the units of gravitational field, little g, um, we've been looking at them in meters per second squared but you can also use newtons per kilogram. All right, that's okay. Newtons per kilogram. Uh, these units are equivalent, and if you break them down into their base units, like we've been doing in the last couple of weeks, you, you should get the same base units. Okay, so that's gravitational potential energy. Kinetic energy is a half mass times the square of the velocity, all right, which should be, again, familiar to you from your earlier work, or half mv squared, which is how most people remember it. All right, so mgh and a half mv squared for those two types of energy. Uh, that's when the energies are constant. What about when the energy values are changing? Okay, so here uh, is what we usually do to those equations when we've got changes in energy. We use the delta symbol as usual for any change. So change in the gravitational potential energy is equal to mass times gravity times a change in height. We're usually assuming, and in most circumstances it's true, that the gravitational field strength is constant and also the mass of the object is constant. So it's the height that changes. All right, so a change in height results in a change in gravitational potential energy. Similarly, a change in velocity results in a change in kinetic energy for an object of constant mass. So we've effectively got half mv squared minus half mu squared. And this, this is factorized for a half m. So you get half m brackets v squared minus u squared. So final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. Quite often one or the other of these is zero because the object either starts from rest or comes to a halt. So 
if it starts from rest, obviously u would be zero, and that then just breaks down to half mv squared. If v is zero, you end up with half m u squared. So that's uh, that's that. Um, now, energy can change, but we also know that there is uh, a conservation law for energy, uh, which states that the total amount of energy in an isolated system remains constant. And I think that's the most succinct way to put that. So we're talking about the total amount of energy. So even though individual values of gravitational or kinetic or thermal energy can change, in total, the amount of energy remains the same. It's just transferred from one to the other. Also, we have to ensure that the system is isolated. Now, no system is truly isolated, so we have to make various assumptions and simplifications. But an isolated system really means that there are no external forces acting on the system. No external forces. So there's no friction. Um, and there's nothing going in and nothing going out in terms of energy, which would be a result of external forces or work being done on the system. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to assume we've got an isolated system in a gravitational field in a minute. But effectively, if you lose one type of energy, that results in a gain in another type of energy, which is equal to the loss, and therefore the total remains the same. And the one we're going to focus on is changes between gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy, because that's really at the heart of mechanics. So this is a two-way system. Um, you can lose GPE and result in an increase in kinetic energy, or you can lose kinetic energy and result in an increase in gravitational energy. And this is very simple to demonstrate. Just throw a ball in the air, and you have it. If it's losing speed and gaining height, and therefore losing kinetic energy and gaining gravitational potential energy, and the opposite on the way back down again. Uh, so rather than the ball, let's have a look at uh, this one. Whoa, let's have a pointer instead. Okay, so this is an Olympic athlete, a uh, gymnast. And what we're going to do is try and estimate what his speeds are going to be. Okay, so I'm going to try and stop him there, right at the top. Okay, so all the way through that little video that you saw, um, he was changing his energy between gravitational potential energy at the top and kinetic energy at the bottom. Now, what we want to know is if he falls from that height, how fast will he be going at the bottom? Assuming that he's changing direction at the top there, and so we're going to set u as zero. So what we've done is we've equated the equation for the change in gravitational potential energy to that for the change in kinetic energy. So mg delta h equals a half m v squared minus u squared. We've said u is zero, so that simplifies to a half m v squared. Also, you might notice that mass is on both sides of this equation. And it's the same mass, it's the mass of the athlete. And so that mass actually cancels out. Okay, so this simplifies to quite a nice, easy equation. So you've got G times delta H is equal to a half V squared. And um, what we want to know is what V is, the final velocity when he hits the trampoline. So we can rearrange this. But V on this side is equal to, that half comes up as a 2, so we've got 2GH and square root from that square there. So the final velocity is equal to all that. So let's put some numbers in. Square root of 2. G we're going to use as 10. And then we need to know the height. So I'm going to estimate this height here. We've got vertical height there, which I'm going to say is maybe about 5 meters. So let's call it 5 meters. All right, so square root of 2 times 10 times 5. Well, that bit under there is 100. So when you square that, you get 10. So we're looking at 10 meters per second. All right, so that's how fast he would hit the trampoline um, as he dropped 5 meters. Now, interestingly, um, the mass has cancelled out. And so it doesn't matter how, how much mass the object has. If it's falling 5 meters, it will attain a speed of 10 meters per second at the bottom of that fall. Uh, which kind of links back to what we were saying when we were doing SUVAT, uh, that all objects fall at the same rate, they'll be subject to the same acceleration, and therefore they will attain the same speed after a, a certain displacement. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at changes in energy and equating the two equations, the two expressions here, uh, for one for the other, 
and rearranging to find the object we need while using the principle of the conservation of energy, all right, where all the gravitational potential energy is converted into kinetic energy because we've got an isolated system and there's no work done on the system by anything outside the system, i.e. there's no external forces. Okay, that's it. So thanks for watching.